What a crowd. I love it. Did you all just hear Janice talk about how we need more data in our lives? Did, did you, do you remember that one? Well, buckle up. I've got data. So <laughs> here we go. Woo, that's right. <laughs> My name is Svenja Goodell, and I'm Indeed's chief economist. I lead the Indeed Hiring Lab, which is Indeed's economic research team. That was a fantastic intro. Thank you so much. Today, I invite you to embark with me on a journey through millions of data points, each one offering insights into the labor market, technology, and most importantly, people. The working mom trying to find a job that offers more flexibility. The recent college graduate trying to find a job that offers student loan assistance. And the employer trying to figure out how AI will impact her workforce and how she can help with training. These people and their stories form the backbone of our data and research. So together, we'll uncover insights that shed light on where we are, where we're going, and how we can shape the future of work. We'll begin by exploring where we are right now. We'll dig into some uh, recent labor uh, market trends. And let's kick it off right away with looking at the Indeed, uh, uh, Indeed Jobs Index right here. You can see that right here, this is one of our uh, favorite, uh, favorite data products to dig, dig into. You can really nicely see the initial hit of the pandemic. We dropped a whole bunch in terms of labor demand. Uh, and then we saw job postings picking back up again. And they peaked right around 160, meaning we, have, we had 60% more job postings at the peak of the, the pandemic in late 2021 than we did prior to the pandemic. And since then, gosh, over the last two and a half years or so, we've seen significant cooling in the labor market. And with that, demand has come down quite a bit. However, we're still elevated. You'll see that we're leveling, leveling off right around 113, which means we have 13 more job postings today, 13% more job postings today than we did back on fe in February 2020. So, you know, demand is still relatively high compared to those levels. And it's honestly not like the 2020 market was anything to sneeze at in terms of tightness. Now, that's a bit concerning because it's not obvious where all this labor is going to come from. Who are the people that are going to fill all these jobs, particularly in some areas that are particularly tight? Think about healthcare is one of those areas. So consider looking at the labor force participation rate right here, which is the share of workers in the labor force. And you can see, after the initial dip down, it's come back up quite a bit, but it's plateauing now. You know, we had a bunch of people retiring early, and they never re-entered the labor force, but the good news was that we actually pulled in a whole lot of people into the labor force, like people with a disability, with the help of remote work. Uh, a lot of women re-entered the labor force. So all that was good news, but now we're, we're looking a bit stagnant on, uh, on, on the very top there, and it's unlikely that we're gonna see a whole bunch more people entering in the future. To get a better feel around that, take a look at this prediction for the labor force participation rate. The pink bars here is, is basically a future look, and this is for the US, and you'll see that you know, the future looks a little bit grim in terms of how many people are gonna enter the labor force. We've got an aging and shrinking labor force on our hands, and starting in 2026, we're gonna be hit with this reality that the labor force is gonna to start to contract quite a bit. Now, this isn't just a US problem. This is affecting mostly developed countries all over the world, which you can see quite nicely over here. And we're gonna face this in the very near future, and some countries are already dealing with this today. You can see Japan being one of those countries. That's the, the red line right down there. They're already living this reality today. Now, there are a whole bunch of things that you can do as these trends play out to attract your talent, tool, uh, your talent pool and have as many candidates apply to your jobs. Most employers are lowering their requirements for formal education and years of experience. Our research shows that the share of job postings requiring a college degree, for example, have dropped from 20% to 17%. And the share of job postings asking for a certain number of years of experience have actually dropped from 40% down to 30%. Now, these numbers might not seem like huge decreases, but we're talking about hundreds of thousands of job postings underlying this data, and just as many, if not more, job seekers being impacted by that. 
at the end of the day, what really matters, right, if, is a, if a candidate actually has the skills to perform this job uh, versus some of these signals that we have to rely on when hiring. This shift towards skills first hiring uh, is transforming the way you and many other employers are approaching recruitment. Uh, now, let's pause for a second and think about money. Money is important, right? You need to figure out how much you're willing to pay to attract, the talent, to attract someone. And as a job seeker, you want to know how much am I going to get paid. So money is, is an important thing. In fact, our research has shown that when people consider a new job, the number one reason they list as switching jobs is compensation. So it only is befitting that we track at the hiring lab what wages are doing. This is the Indeed wage tracker right here. It's one of our newer products. And you can see that we topped out at 9% annual wage growth in, the, in 2021. That's huge. That's actually a fairly US-centric uh, result where we have these boom-bust movements. And I mean, that's a, that's a neck uh, 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 breaking pace if you think about having to increase wages by 9% on a year-over-year -year basis. Now, the good news is we've reached more sustainable levels at this point, and we're down to 3.3%. But that's still slightly higher than what we saw in pre-pandemic days. Now, I'm not suggesting everyone has to raise wages all the time when trying to attract talent. There's good news here, too. There are a bunch of things you can do to actually attract talent that doesn't involve directly raising base wages, and there are other, uh, other wage considerations that you can explore. For example, first and foremost, consider transparency to be your friend, right? You wanna at least let people know what is this job going to uh, pay, and you know, what can they expect in terms of either a salary or annual, uh, hourly wages. And this way to, uh, pay transparency really then helps you, I think, have a quicker match, right? A surprise on that front is not what you want. You really want to have candidates that are in line with what you're willing to offer, uh, and you don't want to have to go over at the end of the day. So if you can give people that information up front and reduce information asymmetries, that's a plus. That's exactly where you want to go. And in fact, we're finding in our, in our data that currently 57% of job postings on Indeed have some sort of salary information included in them. And that's up from only 20% five years ago. So we've seen this rapid increase uh, over time, and that's been helping the, the labor market move more efficiently over time. Now, beyond that, if you've posted your wages, you can actually raise wages, there are other things you can do, including offering a signing bonus. You know, uh, we found in our research that job seekers respond very strongly to cash incentives, so it's one of the things we're seeing that's still a popular tool in our data. You'll see even as wages have come down, signing bonuses haven't really uh, gone back to pre-pandemic levels, and that often has to do with the fact that healthcare, being one of the sectors that deals heavily with signing bonuses, is still experiencing sh labor shortages, so we're seeing more and more activity on that front with people still trying to attract folks. Well, at the end of the day, you also want to make sure you're holding in a whole lot of benefits, right? Those are worth a whole bunch of uh, money um, in, indirectly as well. And again, transparency is your friend here. You want to at least tell people in the job posting what benefits you are offering. And we've seen that in our data. We've seen a distinct jump up in how many benefits are being listed. This is the, the share of job postings that have at least one uh, benefit listed in it. And you'll see that uh, we've seen that number come up, and we've also seen a lot of lower wage jobs adding benefits. We're talking healthcare, uh, 401k, paid time off. All these things are really important to job seekers and could make a big difference as you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, how can I attract the best talent? I want that person to click on my job posting. Now, a really popular benefit is still remote work. Uh, you know, having some sort of flexibility either in a full remote or hybrid setting is very attractive to a lot of candidates, hey, including myself. Not that I'm a job seeker. Indeed, don't worry, I'm not leaving anytime soon. I really like my job, but I love being, uh, being working from home, being flexible in, in that way, right? As a working mom, I'm able to drop the kids off and uh, pick them back up from school. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it's very, a little too easy to jump into the office at 8 p.m. to answer a couple more emails, but that flexibility is worth a whole lot for me. I don't think I could go back. A lot of job seekers feel that way too. 
Not that every job can be done remotely, but it's an incredibly uh, interesting and uh, beneficial uh, you know, type of benefit for a lot of people. In fact, and our data shows there's been a, a 3x increase in the number of job postings that offer some sort of either remote work, hybrid work, or something like that uh, at this point. And the data I don't, I'm not showing you here is searches, and we're also seeing that a lot of job seekers still search for this on a regular basis, and that's not coming down at all. Now, we've talked a little bit about transparency, wages, signing bonuses, benefits of all sorts, remote work, and the uh, you know, skills first hiring approach. All these things can help you make, uh, you know, uh, or give you a better chance of attracting talent today. But I'd be remiss if we didn't quickly talk about AI. Of course, you knew that was gonna come up, right? And Gen AI, because really how these tools are gonna impact the labor market of, of tomorrow is gonna be really interesting. And when I say Gen AI, I mean generative AI. And that's, of course, the newcomer on the, on the, on the stage, right? When ChatGPT hit in the middle of 2022, we've seen immense interest along the way. So in order for us to really better understand what's happening with Gen AI and how it will impact the labor market, my team dug deep. And we've been doing a steady flow of research of Gen AI, how Gen AI will impact the labor market. And we actually just released a major report yesterday. Make sure you go to hiringlab.org to check it out. And we really wanted to explore uh, how all the different skills that we have in Indeed will be impacted by this technology. So we took our entire taxonomy stack for our skills, which is 2,800 skills, and we tried to figure out, as part of millions of job postings, of course, how these will be impacted by this technology by looking at three different sectors. First, we tried to figure out um, Gen AI's ability to provide theoretical or background knowledge. That's that first category right there. Then we figured out the ability that Gen AI has to solve certain problems related to that skill. And lastly, the necessity of physical presence when performing that actual skill. And then at the end of the day, we folded all those ratings together to figure out, okay, what is the likelihood that this technology will actually replace a human being in performing that particular skill? What did we find? Well, let's dive right in. First, we, we saw, you can see on the first column right there, Gen AI is pretty good at providing theoretical knowledge for a lot of skills. You know, it's, it's, it's a very powerful tool for that. It's worse at problem solving with no skills achieving the highest rating. That's that emptiness towards the top of the graph on that second column. And the necessity of physical presence is pretty evenly distributed. What it all adds up, and check out the last column for this, for this key result, that's your, that's your money shot right there, basically, is that there are no skills, literally zero, where uh, Gen AI is very likely to replace a human in performing a skill. That's nothing happening at the top row of that graph. And you have a lot of density towards the bottom. You'll see that only 3% of skills are likely to be uh, impacted by Gen AI and someone can actually, this technology can actually take over for a human. The rest kind of sit in the possible and the maybe section. A lot will need to happen for that to, ha for that to actually uh, come to fruition, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Really, it all boils down. What this research shows is that Gen AI augments human skills, but doesn't actually, currently at least, replace them. Next, we took a step from these skills to actually applying them to 16 occupations. Because um, after all, right, what is, what is a job if not a collection of skills and tasks along the way? And we found that for HR professionals, like many of you, uh, Gen AI is generally pretty good at uh, providing theoretical knowledge. That's a big pink, pink bar at the very top. Um, and only modest at problem solving abilities for HR challenges. Not super surprising. A lot of blue on that second, second row there. And uh, the fact that you know, physical hands-on execution is not necessary for many HR uh, tasks might give it a leg up in terms of being a very, very impactful tool here. However, at the end, take a look at the bottom, the bottom bar right here. Gen AI is only likely, and not even very likely, to replace a human for 12% of the tasks in a typical HR role. And that really is a very striking result, right? Think of the, you know, 
ChatGPT or any sort of other uh, Gen AI tool out there is being a very advanced digital assistant to be able to help you, but it's not gonna replace a whole human quite yet. Pretty, pretty good news, right? Collective sigh in the room. I mean, I think we can all agree that economists will be around forever, um, but you know, <laughs> I'm really trying for job security on this one. Uh, so let's try to understand this one a little bit better and figure out what's really going on by digging deeper into the skills for recruiting and staffing occupations. What you see here in this work cloud is uh, a big collection of all the skills we have that are named in, in job postings that we have. And you'll find that there's a really healthy mix of some of the more technical skills that Gen AI tends to be good at and some of the softer skills that Gen AI tends to not be very good at. So for example, uh, if you're looking at Excel, uh, Gen AI is listed as, you know, or rated as likely to uh, replace that particular skill being performed by humans, whereas shockingly recruiting as a skill of recruiter jobs is not very likely to repl be replaced by Gen AI. So that makes a really big difference, right? And that makes sense too, if you think about, right? Excel is probably, you know, uh, 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 one of those tools where you can let it run without interaction, whereas you're not gonna have Gen AI doing interviews for you, figuring out if you like a candidate, what kind of uh, you know, skills need to be assessed along the way. So it's only gonna get you so far. Even when you're asking a Gen AI tool itself, can you do this particular job? It will tell you it cannot fully replace a human interaction and judgment in interviews. So it's self-aware of the fact that it's not gonna get you all the way. The main takeaway is that, you know, Gen AI can ultimately make a really big difference in augmenting human workers and boosting productivity, helping businesses do more with less. And that's really exciting to have that possibility. But we're not quite there yet. You'll see that even though we have immense interest and the growth in uh, Gen AI jobs, which you can see right here, this is our Gen AI tracker, uh, this is the number of job postings that have Gen AI terms in it, um, is growing exponentially, like crazy, right? You see that huge pickup. But take a look at the y-axis. We're not even breaching the 1% yet. So this is off of a tiny, tiny base. So while there are a lot of creators of Gen AI, like you know, machine learning engineers, data scientists, and a lot of actual users of Gen AI, like a marketing professional trying to create content, it's not yet a broad-based phenomenon. You know, additional research is really needed to figure out the impact of AI on the labor market in the future. And a lot will depend on how far this technology can take us. What is true right now is that Gen AI will not take your job. However, the person that knows how to use these tools definitely will take your job. Embracing AI as a tool is the key to staying relevant in this evolving landscape. And there is enormous potential for these tools and this technology to actually help us out. Because at the end of the day, this is really a race between you know, uh, the shrinking labor force that we talked about and the fact that we're facing a demographic cliff. And on the other hand, the fact that we have these technologies that will make us more productive. Who wins that race? will have an enormous impact on the future of work. Thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. If you haven't already, please stop at our hiring lab booth downstairs. We have chart books, we have printouts, we'll walk you through a whole bunch of data. We can do that all day. Um, and of course, check out hiringlab.org. We have all of our research and, uh, and data available there. And as I like to say, you know, Friday night, glass of red wine, a little bit of data. Things happen, y'all. Things happen. All right? Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.